We are on Chapter 7, The Secret to Thriving in a Time of Crisis. Most of life's battles are fought inside ourselves, and our greatest periods of growth usually come during crisis. Robert Sheed The secret to thriving, not just surviving, in a time of crisis is effective management. Let me repeat that with emphasis. The secret to thriving is not just surviving in a time of crisis, is effective management. I am not trying to get on your nerves by reducing everything to statements about effective management. While that may sound like a dull phrase, the reality behind it is far from dull. Yes, effective management itself is mostly a secret, hidden thing, noticeable more when it is missing than when it is operating effectively and smoothly. I will admit that unless you happen to be writing or reading a book about it, or unless your pastor or your business guru has decided to teach about it, you probably will not think much about effective management per se. But when you have a time of crisis, the secret gets exposed. There's only one way out of a crisis good management. You have to manage your way out of your crisis and other people will be watching you. Even if they do not know what to call it, they can see you in action. They will be watching while you manage your way out of your crisis and they will be able to tell whether you did it effectively or not. They will be able to tell whether you are barely surviving your crisis or actually thriving in the midst of it. Certainly other people can see it when you manage your crisis ineffectively. That is when you almost fail to emerge from crisis mode. That's when you stay in a crisis for a long time, stewing and fretting and getting too depressed to exert enough energy to break out. If that is you, I'm sorry to say that it is not effective management. It is some kind of management limited management, inadequate management, incompetent management, but I would not call it effective management. Effective management gets you going. Effective management gets you unstuck. Effective management takes you someplace. Effective management can become exciting, especially in a time of crisis. Who are the people who seem like heroes in a time of crisis? They are the ones who were prepared, even though often they did not realize ahead of time that they were getting prepared for a crisis. How did they end up getting prepared? Simply by living their lives the way God intended, in accord with his principles and in obedience to his commandments. What does obedience to his commandments mean? As you already know, in this book, I'm not referring so much to the Ten Commandments of Moses or to any other set of commandments that can be found in the Bible, but largely to the foundational commandments of God, the earliest commandments that God ever uttered to humankind, commandments that he has never rescinded or amended. These are his original commands to be fruitful, to multiply, and to subdue the earth. That's what he told Adam and Eve to do, and it holds true to this very moment. He himself continues to be in charge of the operation of the entire universe, and he has handed over the management of the operations of the earth to human helpers. That includes you and me. He wants us to look to him for day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year guidance. He wants us to take our marching orders straight from his throne. He wants us to consult with each other and to collaborate together. If we follow his guidance for the details, walking the straight and narrow path that he sets out before us, see Matthew 7, 13 through 14, we will see good results. 
this foundational set of commandments from God as a command or mandate to manage the resources of the earth. It undergirds everything that we do. If we are obedient to this simple set of commands to the best of our faith-filled ability, we will be prepared for whatever comes our way. We will be effective managers and we will be the most likely people to thrive in any crisis. God as boss. God gave human beings the responsibility to manage the earth's resources, but he will always own the resources. In the kingdom of God, nobody owns anything except God. Human beings were given dominion and managership, not ownership. Dominion over the earth's resources is our primary assignment. Once we lay hold of this fact, the purpose of our lives becomes clear. No longer do we need to get anxious about having enough money or food or any other kind of resource. Our job is to manage the resources, not to generate them. Yet being part of God's kingdom does not guarantee us a free ride. Ever since God put forward his divinely inspired goal of having humans extend the culture of heaven on the earth through the cooperation of kingdom citizens such as you and me, the task has involved work. Adam worked the soil to tend the garden. Laboring and sweating, he managed the resources God had provided. That is still true today. Each one of us, separately and together, needs to labor and sweat to manage the resources of the earth. By means of our toil, we reap the fruit we need to sustain our lives and to carry on the effort. The more effective our work, management, the more resources God will give us. In other words, the more effective our management, the more growth we will enjoy. The more growth we enjoy, the more fruit we will reap. The more fruit we will reap, the more of God's kingdom will be established on the earth. God will not trust you with more than you can manage. He simply prevents growth where there is no management. He did not send the rain to water the garden until he had created Adam to manage the growth that would result from it. God will not allow development where there is no management. God will not allow anything to expand unless he has a man or a woman who will manage that development. God's primary measure of trusting you is management. Through your faithfulness and through your faith, God's kingdom gets extended one person at a time. Through your effective management, the necessary resources come to hand. Your effective management attracts more resources so that you can keep on fulfilling your purpose, come what may. Crisis coming and going. A huge part of effective management is being able to manage the crisis that will happen, and crises are inevitable. Any business manager knows this, and so does any parent. If you are going to crumble in the face of a crisis, everything you are responsible for is going to crumble as well, because it is so important to manage crisis as well as possible. I expanded these ideas in chapter 4, where I call them seven ways to manage a crisis. First, determine what your needs are. List them. Do not confuse your wants with needs. Second, only acquire what you truly need. Thirdly, decide not to live beyond your ability. Fourthly, withdraw from the unnecessary. Fifthly, delay major projects. Sixthly, value your possessions. And lastly, save, conserve, and protect your resources. I believe that we need to review these crisis management techniques every time we encounter a new crisis. As human beings, we all tend to have trouble thinking straight when a crisis hits. It seems to be part of any crisis to have a management crisis at the same time. 
When a crisis hits, you need to review what you've learned from previous crises as well as what you have learned from outside sources, such as this book. You will need to remember that each one of us is a mixed bag, always. Nobody is perfect. The whole idea is to keep learning more about how to live in faith, God's way, and to keep maturing as a citizen of the kingdom. When a crisis comes down on top of your head, you may well discover some things that you were doing right all along. Praise God for that. Maybe this time you really were living within your means. So even though the bottom has fallen out of the job market and you are unemployed, you do not have to contend with debts. Maybe you will have acquired what you truly need. So now you will not need to divest yourself of a lot of extra stuff. But I guarantee you that before this crisis ends, you will have learned some new things. Praise God for that too. He is your divine shepherd, and he is making sure that you will be strong enough for the long trek ahead. He is using the circumstances of life to make you into more of a kingdom bringer. The Money Mentality I have said that effective management attracts resources. As a crucial part of managing a crisis, we must identify which resources we truly need, and then we must save, conserve, and protect those resources. Our effective management is expressed by means of effective saving, conserving, and protection of the resources that God has entrusted to us. In the long run, our effectiveness attracts more resources. Sometimes, however, all the resources look as if they have vanished, especially monetary resources. Where did they go? They must be here somewhere. No money got shipped to the moon or to Mars. The billions must still be on Earth somewhere. All the gold and silver must be hidden somewhere. It is up to kingdom citizens to exercise effective management and to manage those monetary resources out of their hiding places. God says, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. Isaiah 45.3 God says he will give you the riches stored in secret places if you save, conserve, and protect or manage the resources he has given you up to this time. Managers get value for their dollars. Managers use their resources effectively without waste. Then, when a time of crisis comes, they keep on doing it. They manage their way right out of the crisis and graduate up a level. When the stock market crashes, they're in a position to buy up the cheap stock. When unemployment hits, they have a cushion in the bank. They were not living above their ability or from paycheck to paycheck. When a natural disaster or a health crisis hits, they have the saved up resources they need to ride it out. If you want God to bless your life, you need to learn how to manage the resources he has entrusted to you now. You need to look at your life through the practical lens of Proverbs, like the following one, which have a lot to say about conserving resources and money. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Proverbs 30, 25. The ant saves in summer because in winter there will be no food. At this point in time, an economic winter is starting to come over our whole earth. Have you conserved your resources? Have you been an ant or not? Of what use is money in the hand of a fool since he has no desire to get wisdom? Proverbs 17, 16. You need to be a man or a woman of integrity, not a person who only pretends to have resources. Pretending to be wealthy doesn't buy you anything. What good is it to acquire a Rolls Royce and park it in front of a one-bedroom house? What do you think you are proving when you get a satellite dish that is bigger than the bedroom roof it is sitting on? 
That is a pretense, and it is a foolish way to handle the money you do have. The writer of Proverbs puts it this way, One man pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Proverbs 13, 7. Dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Proverbs 13, 11. Next time you start to complain about not having enough money, consider this. Except for the youngest child among us, almost all of us have already become millionaires at least once and probably more than once in our lifetimes. Yes, you are a multimillionaire. You just don't have all the money anymore. But you had it when you needed it, didn't you? It went through your hands. Millions of dollars have passed through your hands in some form. And whenever a money crisis has hit, you have learned to turn to the source again. He has always given you what he felt you could manage. He has been giving you management lessons. He is still doing that, and you are still learning. It can take a while to grow up into full maturity as a citizen of the kingdom of God. The secret to thriving in times of crisis is the same as the secret to thriving in the non-crisis times. The secret is management, and effective management implies trust. Get your feet planted solidly on the rock. It's worth any crisis you have to live through. The secret to wealth. Just as currency varies from country to country, so wealth comes in different forms besides money. For the most part, the wealth of the earth comes in the form of all of the many resources that God has created for the earth. We read in Genesis that the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food, Genesis 2.9. The river that watered the garden flowed from four separate headwaters. The first of the four rivers wound through a land where high quality gold could be found. Aromatic resin and onyx were also found there. See Genesis 2 10 through 12. Adam had already been established as the gardener and he was able to appreciate one type of wealth, edible fruit. One type of wealth, food, comes from the soil by means of agriculture. He understood too that the reason the trees of the garden flourished was because of the water furnished by the river. So water turns out to be another form of wealth. The tissues of the human body are more than half water. People cannot get along without water and food. Moving outside the garden itself, God was giving Adam and his descendants several other types of wealth as well. One was gold, which has been considered valuable since ancient times. By extension, other precious metals, such as silver, are also a form of wealth. Another form of wealth that is noteworthy to this day is oil resin. Oil represents fuel for cooking, warmth, and in modern times, transportation and industry. Last, we have onyx, which represents precious stones of all types, including diamonds. I call these the five foundations of wealth. First, fruit or food. Second, water for life support. Third, gold and other precious metals. Fourth, resin or oil for fuel. And five, onyx and other precious stones. God gave each of these to Adam. In essence, God said, Adam, I give you every fruit for food. See Genesis 2.16. Then he said, I give you water. Then I give you gold. I give you resin. I give you onyx. By giving them to Adam, God was giving them to us. Because these five commodities are foundational, anyone who deals effectively in them will be able to become wealthy. When a time of crisis comes, people will revert to the foundational commodities. Which would you rather have in a time of crisis? A valley filled with vegetables or a silicone valley? God gave beautiful advice to Adam. He started with agriculture and water. They are like the foundations of the foundations. After food and water are secured, then Adam could go digging in the ground for gold, 
oil, and precious stones. When we reverse the priorities, we die for lack of food. We have discovered that the hard way by making the last priorities first. Instead of taking good care of the resources that God gave to us, we've messed them up. We have fouled up the water and the soil with chemicals and erosion and over-cultivation. We have fought wars over gold, oil, and other types of wealth. We keep going after things that human beings do not really need. In a nutshell, we are greedy. We must keep coming back to greed as the reason for our economic crisis. People have desired more wealth than they could manage, and they have not been afraid to do harm to acquire it. They have confused their wants with their desires. The whole time they have divorced themselves from God, who could have instructed them with wisdom and the ability to manage the resources they had at the beginning. When we reverse the priorities, we mismanage the resources. And when we mismanage the resources, we lose them. A good part of the time we are creating our own economic crisis, don't you think? When you find yourself in a time of financial instability, it may be the right time to sell your assets that are mere decorations. You pay $10,000 for that diamond, and then you put it in a drawer. Maybe now is the time to dig it out and turn it back into a liquid asset so you can buy food and water with it. Sometimes common sense provides the best kind of wisdom. It may be time to offload some things, to withdraw from some of the complications of owning too many possessions, to get back to the basics of life. The Power of Effective Management The power of effective management can be summed up as effective dominance. Dominance does not have to be a bad word. When you dominate something, you are managing it. You can dominate or manage with wisdom and restraint and with self-sacrifice and love. The idea of dominance does not have to imply brutal force or unwelcome pressure. In fact, if everyone exercised the right kind of dominion, we would all have enough resources because, as I've already explained, effective management attracts more resources. Dominance does not mean that a few people are in charge and that the rest of the people have to submit. When God told Adam, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, he was summing up what it would take for Adam and his descendants to be effective in managing the resources of the earth. In actual fact, God did not tell Adam to subdue the other people who would populate the earth. That kind of dominance is what has given the word a negative connotation. God told Adam to subdue the earth's resources. We are descended from Adam. Therefore, like him, we have the same assignment. Be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. And this means manage the resources. In the context of that universal purpose statement for all of humankind, God has given every single individual an assignment, a purpose. You have a part to play as much as I do. Each one of us has a part to play in bringing in the kingdom of God on the earth. Look at how the message version of Genesis puts it. God spoke. Let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God bless them, prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, given them to you for food. To all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes, I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. 
God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. Genesis 1, 26 through 31, the message version. God created the first people to reflect his nature. He created resources so that they could survive and thrive. He wanted both the people and the resources to be multiplied to fill the earth. He wanted the culture of the earth to reflect the culture of heaven. And that means that he wanted people to prosper. In order to prosper, they simply had to follow God's instructions to be fruitful, to multiply, and to subdue or dominate the earth. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Yet, without even thinking very hard, you can start to get discouraged. By this time, everything in the world is so badly messed up. Where can you start to undo the mess? Everywhere you turn, you find a crisis or a crisis in the making. Often, those crises were made by somebody else, and you cannot make another person or country or human culture change, can you? Why should you even bother about it? You cannot undo the past, but you can do something with your own life. In fact, your own life is all you have to offer. Your personal assignment. What portion of the resources of the earth has God created you to manage, subdue, or dominate? He has given you some kind of an assignment because he has built into every human being a purpose, something to produce, something to reproduce. Your assignment does not have to be gardening or farming or gathering food as it was for Adam. Your assignment will use whatever natural and spiritual gifts God has given you. It will encompass the whole of your life, not only your career path. It may well be a collaborative assignment, something that will require you to work alongside other people without whom you will not be able to accomplish your purpose. Most of our assignments are collaborative. If you have a gift of musical talent, ask God what he wants you to do with it. Does he want you to sing by yourself in the shower? Or does he want you to multiply your gift by reproducing your music on a CD? Does he want you to instruct and encourage budding musicians? Does he want you to coordinate the musical efforts of other people, thereby helping to fill the earth with music? If you are supposed to have dominion over the earth, you must use what resources and gifts you started with, and with God's help, multiply and distribute them. You need to distribute goods and services. You cannot stockpile your goods in warehouses, literally or figuratively, or you may die of poverty, and so may the people who are supposed to receive your goods. Any business person knows that the number one burden on business is inventory. Excess inventory is a business killer. Excess inventory means that your fruit is stored up instead of getting taken to market. Taking it to market is distribution, multiplication. Distributing it effectively is the same as subduing the market. If you subdue your market, you can control it, and you can take dominion in that market, which is a little corner of the earth. Go beyond managing your crisis. So whether you're in a time of crisis right now or whether you are preparing and bracing for a crisis storm, conserve your resources, but do not hoard them. The secret to thriving in times of crisis is to effectively manage the resources you have, starting with the most important ones. Find out what your fruit is and multiply it. Ask God to help you do it rely on his guidance and his strength all day long, every day of your life. Then, when a crisis hits, you will be able to manage that too with the strength that God supplies. If in the course of fulfilling your kingdom responsibilities, you discover that you have strayed somewhat, get back on the path by repenting and going back to where you strayed so you can resume making progress. If you accumulate too much stuff or too many extra responsibilities and you have to offload something, 
do it as fast as you can. If you have to change your tactics, change quickly. You will have to work hard, so just do it. Do not be lazy. Keep pressing forward. Do not make your personal comfort your primary goal. Yes, you will get tired. You will hurt sometimes. You will suffer physical, emotional, and spiritual storms. Some of your toil and sweat is not Christ's great toil and sweat. It is just the normal level for your life. Sometimes, though, you will hit a crisis time and so will the people around you. A crisis is always uncomfortable, but do not worry about the discomfort. You will be all right. God is still in charge. His words to Adam apply to you right in the middle of your current crisis. Be fruitful. Multiply. Subdue the earth. Just keep doing it, even if your tactics have to change because of your circumstances. Get beyond managing your crisis. Start thriving right in the midst of it. Soon, your crisis will be history, and you will enter into a time of new abundance. Wow, thank you so much for tuning in today to the reading of Chapter 7. The Secret to Thriving in a Time of Crisis. My friend, it has been an honor to read this book. I am so blessed, so honored to have stumbled upon Dr. Miles Monroe because he breaks down the kingdom message in such a way that even now, for our generation, for our time, we will effectively manage the resources that God has given us on earth. And we will start doing it today. And we will reassess our wants and our needs. And we will live within our means. And we will always be prepared for what comes our way. Now, God never said that we wouldn't have crisis. But he did say this, that he prayed for us. And my friend, I truly believe that if God prayed for me, then everything works together for the good of me and you. All right? Thanks for tuning in today. I love you with the love of Christ. As always, be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Bye.